Good prayer, Warren. You've read the passage. <laughs> that may make sense of my title, Eyes Straight Ahead. Um, I hope that becomes apparent as we go through it. But our passage this morning uh, brings the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke to a close, and we're going to be reading uh, verses 51 through 62 of uh, his ninth chapter. Each of the four, four uh, Gospels is structured around internal movements uh, within, uh, birth narratives, uh, the launch of Jesus' public ministry, time spent in Galilee, acceptance and rejection, and of course, ultimately, uh, the cross, uh, the fulfillment of his uh, mission, as Warren uh, mentioned in his uh, prayer, followed by the resurrection, and then ultimately, his ascension into heaven. And when we come to verse 51 of Luke 9, we arrive at the beginning of a new movement, at which point in time, Luke explains, Jesus definitively sets his face toward Jerusalem to meet up with the completion of that mission, the mission of his incarnation. It seems unusual to me, not to me alone, but others as well, <clears throat> that the original editors of our New Testament, who, you know, they're the ones that decided the limits of the verses and the chapters that we have in our uh, Bibles, uh, did not make this 51st uh, verse the beginning of a new chapter. For from this point on, until something like the 44th verse of chapter 19, when Jesus enters into uh, the temple in Jerusalem, it is his journey along the road there that Luke describes. Uh, not necessarily exactly uh, chronologically or always ge geographically, but his final destination looms in the background of it all. Uh, Jesus has still uh, much more to say and to do in order to prepare his disciples uh, for the future. And so there's much instruction and in teaching uh, these next 10 or so chapters uh, contain. <clears throat> but throughout, we are to understand that he's undertaking everything with his eyes straight uh, forward, straight ahead to Jerusalem, uh, to the passion of the cross and his ultimate ascension back to glory. So let's read it, uh, beginning in verse 51. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him. And they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. I know uh, many of your Bibles uh, have that next to last line in brackets. Uh, the, so, most of the uh, older manuscripts don't contain that line, so it was possibly a, a later scribal addition uh, to the text. But it makes sense, it's explanatory, um, and so most versions choose to include it, but show it in brackets. You're familiar with this. And then verse 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, yes, Lord. <laughs> and Jesus said to him, so this man says, I will follow you wherever you go. <clears throat> and Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, 
follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I am uh, what you might call a serial anticipator. I know many of you are as well, some event upcoming, uh, some respite, some special occasion awaits in the days or weeks or months ahead, and I eagerly anticipate its uh, arrival so that it occupies way too much of my uh, thoughts. Uh, the child's question, are we there yet? Uh, was not invented by me, but it was honed to perfection. Uh, summer after summer in our family's car on the way to the great outdoors. Uh, sadly, such a state of mind works also in the opposite direction when what looms at some near date is not welcome at all and our anticipation of it is more that of dread. In Luke's opening uh, verse of his new section, verse 51, he describes the unique anticipation of our Lord. And I emphasize, I use the word unique as it should be used. This was the unique anticipation of our Lord as his understanding deepened that the great culmination of his earthly life was imminent. He was eager uh, to meet up with it for sure, though undoubtedly with a mix of both satisfaction and dread. Indeed, no man has ever more fervently looked ahead to such a momentous occasion. Uh, Luke identifies it, see there, as the time when the days were approaching for his ascension. Now that's an intriguing phrase uh, combining two complementary ideas. The first, that of the fulfillment, that's in the word there, the, the, the fulfillment of what was for him a definitive divine plan. The days were approaching mean, meant that the predetermined timeline was reaching its terminus. He was entering a new phase leading to the final consummation. The second idea is that the terminus was to be his ascension a word commonly used to refer to death, even to dying and, and going to uh, heaven. On the Mount of Tr Transfiguration, remember, when Moses and Elijah appeared conversing with the glorified Lord, uh, they were speaking, Luke tells us, they were speaking of his departure. The word is exodus. They were speaking of his uh, exodus. They were speaking <clears throat> of the redemptive uh, work on the cross he was about to undertake, culminating in his uh, resurrection and in his appearances and uh, ultimately to his ascension into glory. But the first step in the accomplishment was of that was to be the agony of the cross. And so Luke pictures for us here Jesus' remarkable courage in that he was determined uh, to go to the place where he would suffer. Uh, literally, uh, he set his face to go there. In Isaiah's uh, third servant song, in Isaiah 50, verse 7, and you, you know there were four servant songs. We normally uh, most often quote from the fourth servant song. But in the third servant song, in the seventh verse of Isaiah chapter 50, we discover something like a prequel uh, to that. Uh, and the servant speaks there in that verse saying, I have set my face like flint. And that idea was likely in the Lord's mind and in, certainly in Luke's mind as well. The King James Version translates it, he steadfastly set his face. I like the translation, he res resolutely set a course. Uh, there was an undeterred resolve that was to characterize his acts and his movements in the days ahead. And Luke will from here on 
proceed to plant flags uh, along the way, uh, marking them. Just two verses down, for example, in, in, in verse 53, he was traveling toward Jerusalem. In chapter 12, verse 50, uh, I have, a, years ago, I, when I first, when a teacher first pointed this out to me, I started writing these verses down in, in my Bible. But in, in chapter 12, verse 50, he said, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. In chapter 13, verse 22, passing through one city and village to another, he was proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. In chapter 17, verse 11, while he was on the way to Jerusalem. In chapter 18, verse 31, he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. And there are other flags uh, as well. He set his face like flint to meet up with his profound destination. My illustration of a car trip to the mountains trivializes uh, the thought. What, what Luke describes in these next several chapters ought to fill us with awe. Uh, and in our own individual hearts, uh, we're moved uh, to utter perhaps a silent prayer. You did it for me. But Luke quickly uh, brings us back in verse 52 to the more mundane details of the Lord's journey with his disciples. Uh, the passages before this have not informed us exactly of where they are, were at the moment, except they, they had been traversing in the northern uh, regions in Galilee. But the Gospels are true to what we plainly see on a map in between Galilee and Judea, where Jerusalem stood, was the land of Samaria. So having set his face to go to Jerusalem, as, remember as Jesus had memorably uh, done in the reverse direction uh, in John chapter 4 in that scene with the uh, Samaritan woman at the well, he had to pass through uh, Samaria or as some of the translations had it, he must needs pass through uh, Samaria. There were 12 disciples uh, with him, but we know that there were likely uh, more than that. Uh, the initial verses of chapter eight provide the names of several women who were traveling uh, with them, uh, assisting them, even contributing to their support. Ma Mary Magdalene, uh, jo Joanna, uh, Susanna, and, and others. So it was likely a rather unwieldy uh, group uh, that set out along the way with our Lord. And, and Luke describes in verse 52 how uh, consequently he sent messengers on ahead of him and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But there they met with an obstacle on the road. Uh, the villagers were not willing to receive them because they were aware of their destination, that, that they were traveling to uh, Jerusalem. All, almost all of you know, I know, uh, about this long-held ancient uh, animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews. It went back centuries to the Assyrian conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel when the Assyrians had relocated uh, the conquered uh, Jewish people uh, there to their own cities, but left there in the land a, a remnant, uh, typically of the less educated, the, the less accomplished, who over the ensuing decades uh, entered married uh, with other people so that there arose a mixed race population later uh, derided by the Jews as racial half-breeds. They were identified as Samaritans, not Jews, and they pursued their religion in their own way, setting up a rival temple on Mount Gerizim, establishing their own canon of scripture, uh, composed only of a, a special edition of the Pentateuch. Uh, they fashioned their own distinct liturgy and the animosity between the two turned into hatred over the years, and the centuries were marked by frequent confrontations and disputes between the two. Though there's evidence 
that Samaritan inns were not always closed to Jewish travelers. We, it was firmly established that if the Jewish travelers' destination was Jerusalem, they would receive no hospitality from the owners of the inn. That was the case here, uh, the obstacle that they met up with. And Luke describes in verses 54 through 56 how James and John uh, responded to this snub. Uh, they turned to Jesus and said, like all of us would do, I'm so sure, Lord, do you want us to command fire uh, to come down from heaven and consume them? Uh, James and John had somehow uh, received a nickname uh, from uh, the Lord. And uh, we, we find it uh, in Mark 3.17. He called them Boanerges, which means uh, sons of thunder. And this may be an example of the pugnacious spirit that gave uh, rise to that. And remember, in the paragraph just before this, uh, we studied a couple of weeks ago, it was John who you know, blundered into boasting to Jesus how he had interve intervened in this situation where a, a d disciple, a self-proclaimed disciple of Jesus had been casting out demons, but uh, John objected because he was not part of uh, the 12. He was not part of their group. And Jesus corrected him there, and here he corrects James and John as well. Now, we should give them uh, a little bit of credit. Admittedly, uh, their uh, proposed intent revealed an admirable faith in the powers they had at their disposal because of Jesus' name. Uh, and they may even have had the best of intentions. Think about this, perhaps still uh, awestruck from their experience on the mount with Elijah and maybe they had been ruminating on that. We've seen Elijah and, and recalled the instance in uh, the uh, Old Testament in 2 Kings uh, chapter 1 where Elijah himself uh, had uh, called down fire from heaven uh, to destroy these captains with their fifties that the king of Israel had sent to, to, to capture him. And God had sent the fire, and he had consumed the captains with their fifties. But their zeal and devotion to the reputation of the Lord belied a fundamental misunderstanding of the spirit of Jesus that was to animate them. Luke says that Jesus rebuked them, and perhaps Luke <clears throat> simply left it at that in the manuscript of his gospel. Uh, without an explanation of why he rebuked them, or it may have been that the continuation of what Jesus actually said or, or what a later scribe added for clarification and so bracketed, as I said, in our versions because of the uncertainty of the text, uh, maybe that provides the lesson that he intended to convey. The Son of Man had not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And those who would uh, follow after him must be inspired by the same desire, to show mercy uh, rather than violence, uh, to be tolerant of the ignorant shortcomings of those who would oppose the gospel. That was the patient attitude of the Lord wherever he would go. Uh, the Son of Man, he would say, has, had come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, We'll read that in, in Luke chapter 19. He would say, uh, uh, he, had, he, he, he said, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And such a merciful spirit should characterize those of us who would desire to be faithful to the Lord as his disciples. Too often we display anger rather than mercy. I've told you, our routine on Sunday mornings. We've got this news program on, and uh, I get mad every uh, Sunday morning at these nincompoops and what they have to have to say. But uh, I need to show more mercy to them. They're ignorant, but. Uh, <laughs> Our anger exposes, I think, a, a bit of a prideful spirit 
rather than the spirit of Christ. Jesus said, blessed, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Luke concludes the section by relating how Jesus then guided his disciples to another village. He was not deterred from his mission by the resistance that he encountered. The decision had already been made and his resolve to carry it out was implacable. That was in contrast, however, to some would-be disciples introduced beginning in verse 57, whose resolve turned out to be lacking. For them, uh, the willingness to follow Christ was present, but they misunderstood the degree of self-sacrifice required. And in each case, the Lord would educate them on the demands of the road of discipleship and the kind of devotion required of its stringent nature. And we hear in these verses the same familiar chords Jesus recited earlier in verse 23. If anyone wishes to follow me, uh, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Well, we have uh, little in the way of detail identifying uh, the three who aspired to such a path. One underestimated uh, the hardship and sacrifice that would come. Uh, the next, the urgency of our calling. And the last, the single-minded devotion required. The first was bold as the contingent was making their way down the road, he made known his firm decision. I will follow you wherever you go. It was bold, uh, but it was also common, which one of us has not uh, dared before to make such a claim. Uh, when the spirit of Peter somehow uh, overcomes us and like him in the upper room, uh, that evening before the Lord was arrested, we join our voice with Peter's, Lord, with you, I'm ready to go both to prison and to death. He was ready to lock arms with Jesus and follow him wherever he went, except Jesus responded immediately there in chapter 22 and verse 34, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you even know me. Peter underestimated uh, what it would mean to follow Jesus in that way. It would mean hardship and sacrifice. And here he puts it in the familiar context of their natural environments. They had a lot of foxes in the land uh, back then. Uh, foxes were, were plentiful. Uh, they would conduct their, their raids, their dinner raids, uh, and then in the evenings, and then when the light began to come up, they would go to their familiar holes or, or their uh, uh, burrows, and, and, and they would be safe, and they, they would find rest. And the birds are the same. We see the birds everywhere, and uh, typically they're feeding. When they're not tormenting squirrels, they're feeding. They're finding seed and grain and that sort of thing. And, but then they're gone. Where are they? They're, they're hidden in their nest, uh, perched in safe spots. But the Son of Man had nowhere uh, to lay his head. Now we know that he did on occasion have homes uh, where he could sleep at night, friends, uh, family perhaps. Uh, but his public life was characterized by a series of rejections, of hatred, of rebuff, uh, this world was not his home. And Jesus was saying that to follow him, one must embrace a life of discomfort. Uh, that's something the majority of 21st century Western world Christians know little of. But in Jesus' words, we must hear his call for us to examine ourselves and to ask whether we ever do, in fact, suffer a deprivation or discomfort because of our identification with and because of our service to the Lord. In athletics, uh, we often speak of which team has the most want to 
in the contest. You, you've said that yourself probably. I think one team wants it a lot more than the other team uh, wants it. And that, that is, which is willing to endure the most discomfort and the most sacrifice in order to attain to the goal, to, to win? Which one wants it more? And that's always been an argument for encouraging uh, children to participate in some kind of, of sport. It's because it teaches them, at least I believe this, it teaches them the necessity of hard work and sacrifice in order to obtain to a desired end, something that you want in the end. I'll always remember an August day before my senior year in high school when uh, one of my football friends drove up to pick me up, to take me to that first horrific day of full pad uh, practice in the summer before the season uh, began. And I got in the car and he just sat there. And I said, what are you doing? He said, let's not go. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea, let's not uh, go. But the joke was that we would have rather done almost anything other than what we were about to do. And yet we did it because we didn't want to give up on the goal that we both had. And looking back, the goal probably had something to do with girls. But, <laughs> but this is convicting to me. Uh, for I do know fellow saints who, because of their decision, uh, to follow uh, faithfully after Jesus, they sacrifice immensely. Uh, they give until it hurts. They suffer insult and discomfort and voluntarily subject themselves to deprivation uh, rather than living a life of simple ease, of, of only pursu pursuing what gives them pleasure and comfort. They may have a comfortable home and the means to indulge uh, only in the pleasures of the world if they so choose, but they choose to leave it and to join with the Lord on the road of discipleship. In the next exchange between Jesus and a would-be follower, it is Jesus who initiates. He, he spoke to him, follow me. And there was a willingness on this man's uh, part, but also a reservation. He said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. <clears throat> that sounds reasonable uh, to our ears. Let me go first and bury uh, my uh, father. The fifth commandment uh, calls upon us to honor our father and our uh, mother. And certainly it's an honorable thing when a parent dies uh, for the children uh, to uh, show them regard and honor them uh, with, with burial, with, with, with a, a, a memorial. It would have seemed even more reasonable for a Jew in Jesus' day. Burial of the dead was considered a religious duty that took precedence over many things. It took precedence over the study of the law or temple service or, or other obligations. To leave it undone for a Jew uh, in this day was considered scandalous. If, if you remember, Elisha was allowed first to go home simply to say goodbye to uh, his parents before leaving to follow Elijah. And so students of our passage over the years have attempted to soften the tone of the Lord's subsequent answer by suggesting that the man's father was not actually dead yet, but he was probably near death. And so the man was only asking for a delay in order to wait until his father actually died. Then he could fulfill his duties after his father died and, and then fulfill the Lord's uh, request. They, they argue that if the man's father had already died, then he probably would not have been there at that place at that moment. He would have been at his home where his father had died because burials in the ancient East took place as soon as possible after death. Well, that may be true, uh, but the Lord's response 
to him reflects the urgency of the work of discipleship. And if the man's father, think about this, if the man's father had truly died, then the sense of urgency, which is the point here, uh, would be doubly emphasized. Jesus said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. And so surely uh, what Jesus meant was that considering this urgency, uh, the urgency of the mission, it would be sufficient for the spiritually dead to tend to the burial of the physically dead. And such is the condition of those who are not following Jesus. They've missed the life associated with Jesus' coming. They're spiritually dead. But for those who have chosen that life in him, serving him as his disciple takes precedence over what might be considered the most invaluable service according to the world. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus said, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Or as Jesus commanded here, go, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. The description now of uh, the third man in the final verses gives us another declaration of resolve, but also another reservation. This man said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And again, here, uh, the logic of the man's requests serves to underscore the stringency of Jesus' demands for his disciples. Thinking back to that, that scene with Elisha and Elijah and his request, very similar to this one. And Elijah's <clears throat> willing assent to it. Sure, go back and say goodbye to your family and then come and we'll go about our mission. Uh, it, forces us to realize that following Jesus Christ can never be compared to following a prophet. We're following Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe and our Savior. We may all feel uh, the tug of a former way of life that demanded far less of us and allowed indulgences that are not now ours to have. But the agricultural figure that Jesus uses of the plowman plowing the furrow straight ahead, one beside the other, uh, you know, going out on traveling in the country and passing the fields, you see them, these perfect rows that have been made. Uh, but then looking back, what if the farmer had looked back uh, to see what was behind him and lost focus on the job at hand, we'd laugh. <laughs> it was the drunk farmer uh, because his rows were not straight. It's the reminder we need, uh, as Leon Morris noted in his commentary, that his kingdom has no place for those who look back when they're called to go forward. That was the conclusion the Apostle Paul reached. He wanted to know Christ. This is Philippians 3, just an awesome chapter in our Bibles. He wanted to know Christ, and he was willing to suffer the loss of all things and to count them but rubbish so that he might gain Christ. He, he wanted that experience, that posture for himself. And so he wrote in Philippians 3, verse 13, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Not turning back from the plow and looking behind, but forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That is the theme of the Lord's exhortations here at the end of our chapter.
as he sets his course for a final visit to Jerusalem. As for you, go, Jesus said. Go forth in spite of sacrifice and hardship. Go with a sense of urgency. Go with your eyes straight ahead, just as Jesus himself. Spurgeon uh, issued uh, this encouragement couched in a warning of sorts. I am afraid, he said, for you who go ankle deep into the faith and never venture further. I am afraid that you might return to the shore. But as for you who plunge into the center of the stream and find waters to swim in, I have no fears. You shall be carried onward by a current ever increasing in strength till in the ocean of eternal love you shall lose yourselves in heaven above. May that be our own experience, our own commitment. May we take aim at the deep end and set our face like flint to finish the course our Lord has upon us, not flagging or wavering or wandering off to vain distractions. When we do that, we will be following in his steps. Well, let's pray that way. Lord, thank you for uh, this beautiful uh, passage. Thank you for a willing Savior, the Lord Jesus, who did set his face to go to Jerusalem. He did accomplish his mission, and because of that, we're safe. Uh, we are uh, free, uh, free to serve you, free to uh, live, give, sacrifice, urgently uh, minister to friends and, and, and the people that come around us. Uh, Lord, may we not waver. Uh, strengthen us by your spirit to, to do that, and may we give glory to you in all that we do and say. Bless our church. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, our church might be characterized by members who are uh, like the Lord Jesus. We resemble him, and people recognize in each of us our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.